one step past. Action Heroes of History Indian Fighter Madeline Day Fairshare A 14 year old girl held off an Indian raid for eight days until soldiers arrived. It was an impressive feat and she has since become a national heroine of Canada. Comparisons have been made to Joan of Arc. Before we get started, I want to state that Indians aren't the bad guys all the time, but they are this time, so deal with it! There's bad white people too. Meet Madeline. The heroine we know as Madeline de Verchere was born as Marie Madeline Jarre on March 3, 1678. She would ultimately be the fourth of 12 children. Madeline and her family lived at Verchere in present-day Quebec. Back then, the province of Quebec was called New France. Madeline's father, Francois, was not of noble birth, but he was a member of the French military sent to New France. In 1672, Francois was given a sizable area of land called a seigneury by the government in recognition of his military service. The area was called Verchere. This is a word that can be a last name. In the late 19th century, Verchere also became an adjective for a type of rowboat that was invented in the area. Today, Verchere still exists as a suburb of Montreal and is located near the St. Lawrence River. But why was Francois sent to New France to begin with? The French had been trying to settle in New France for a long time. This put them at odds with the Iroquois Indians who had already been living there from the 1640s to 1701. This period of time has been referred to as the Iroquois Wars. Things were ugly. The French did some things, the Indians did some things, it all could have been handled better. The French and the Iroquois were not going to be friendly with each other for some time. Madeline's father built a small wooden fort in Verchere to protect his home, family, and the 11 other families who lived in the area. Madeline's Childhood Madeline's childhood wasn't all fun and flowers. The threat of being attacked by the Iroquois was always very real. She could still be a little girl, but she had to be wary. Madeline also worked in the family field. In 1686, Madeline had lost her older brother Antoine to the Indians. She lost another older brother, Francois Michel, to the Indians in 1691. In addition, Madeline lost two brothers-in-law who had been married to her sister Marie Jeanne in 1687 and 1691. Madeline had to become acquainted with the idea of death from a very early age, and it's easy to understand why she wasn't particularly fond of the Iroquois. Red Morning It was October 22, 1692. Madeline's parents, Francois and Marie, were away from home. Her father had been called away to Quebec City for military duty. Madeline's mother had gone to Montreal to purchase supplies for the coming winter. Madeline was 14 years old and the oldest child living at home, so she was put in charge of the home and the fort. The fort was shorthanded to say the least. Just so you don't think Madeline being put in charge was pure nepotism, you should know that she was always a resourceful girl and known for her excellent marksmanship. She was a tough girl, and so was her mother. At this time, only two of Madeline's brothers were with her at the fort. She did have other younger siblings at this time, but it's uncertain where they were. In Madeline's own account of the situation, she states the brothers were both twelve. Other sources tell us their names were Louis and Alexander. Madeline had a servant named La Violette who was 80 years old. Only two soldiers were available to help guard the fort. As it would turn out, they were totally worthless. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning. All was seemingly peaceful, but the threat of an Iroquois attack was always very real. That fall had seen a number of Indian attacks, but there hadn't been one for a while and no one was for certain that there was going to be a raid. Even if there was an attack, it was believed that the settlers were relatively prepared. 
about 22 people were working in the fields. Allegedly, eight of these people acted as armed guards to protect the busy harvesters from danger. Madeline herself was working in the cabbage patch not all that far away from the fort. In a few moments, that short stretch would feel like a marathon race. No one in this relatively peaceful, but always uneasy scene knew that some Iroquois were nearby, hiding in the thickets. How many of them were there? It's believed that there were anywhere from 40 to 50. No one, including Madeline, would take the time to do an accurate head count. They didn't work for the census, and they liked their scalps. Why did the Indians pick today of all days to strike? Did they really know Madeline's parents were gone and believe that Vercher was easy pickings? Their motivations are unclear. It might have just been business as usual for them. The Indians quickly pounced on the settlers and caught them unaware. Madeline heard several shots from the muskets used on the settlers. Laviolette, the aged servant, was already in the fort and shouted to Madeline, Fly, mademoiselle, fly! The Iroquois are upon us! When Madeline turned to look, she got the shock of her life. She figured it had to be about 45 Indians, all coming at her and already dangerously close. She was wearing a kerchief around her neck at the time. One Indian grabbed onto it, but good fortune was with Madeline that day. She quickly untied the neckerchief and slipped away. The Iroquois realized that they weren't going to catch Madeline, so they shot at her instead. Were they shooting to kill her? Or was it just warning shots to make her stop? At any rate, none of the muskets that were fired at her made their mark. When Madeline got close enough to the fort, she cried, To arms! To arms! She was hoping that at least one of the two soldiers would come out to help her, but this didn't happen. <laughs> there were two women outside the gate in tears. They had just seen their husbands get killed and were out of their heads with grief. Madeline, like a little mother hen, made them go inside with her. Our young heroine was in for another shock. There were no armed soldiers to be seen. No one from inside the fort was shooting at the Indians. The fort wasn't all that much to begin with, and the people inside were definitely in peril. What was going on? According to Madeline's own words, she shut the gate behind her by herself. In some written accounts, we hear that Laviolette helped her close the gate, or that one of her brothers helped. It's possible that, in all the excitement, someone helped her close the gate and she just didn't notice. Intermission Let's give Madeline a moment to catch her breath so we can take a look at Fort Vercher. It's not a very tall or impressive fort. It's a rough, rectangular stockade about 12 to 15 feet high. Like you would expect, the walls were stakes made out of logs. A bastion was at each corner. What's a bastion? A bastion can be made in many ways, but it is a part of the fort that projects out from the corner and allows a person to attack from several directions, usually with gunfire. Bastions are going to be important in this story. The fort had only one gate on the river side. There was no moat or any sort of outside protection. The bastions were it. Inside the fort was the Jarret family's manor house. There was also a redout that acted as a guardhouse and armory. Madeline called it a redout. If we were trying to be all technical and stuff, this type of building was probably more of a blockhouse. But since this is Madeline's story, we'll be kind to her and just agree that it's a redout. Last, but not least, there was a cannon. It more or less served as an alarm system because a single cannon wouldn't do much to repulse the enemy. This is what they had. A fort on a shoestring budget to fight off a bunch of angry Indians. Stress levels were high. Back to the action. Once inside the fort, Madeline looked around and noticed that several of the stakes in the walls had been knocked over leaving gaps that could make it easy for the Iroquois to enter. Madeline ordered the small number of people at her disposal to raise the stakes back into place. She helped with the stakes, 
but certainly couldn't help with all of them as she had other pressing matters to attend to. Madeline headed to the redoubt for guns and whatever she could use to fight the Indians. When she got inside, she found the two missing soldiers, Labonte and Gallet. One of them was lying down on the floor. The other was holding a burning fuse. What are you going to do with that fuse? Madeline asked the soldier. I want to set fire to the powder and blow up the fort, answered the soldier. The soldiers wanted a quick, merciful death instead of defending the fort and its people. They were willing to kill everyone in the fort rather than do their duty. This enraged Madeline. You are a miserable wretch, she said. Be gone. I command you. At least the fort wasn't going to be blown up. Madeline didn't have a lot of time to think, but she already knew that she was going to need strategy to repel the attackers. Immediately, she knew that the Indians needed to think the fort was full of soldiers. She took off her hat and put on a soldier's cask. Cask is a French word for helmet. This helmet may have looked something like a hat. I need to hit the pause button on this part of the story. A lot of illustrations made of Madeline have shown her wearing men's clothes along with a man's hat. Historians like to argue if Madeline actually wore men's clothes or if it was even necessary. In the years that came after this incredible story, people that told it like to compare Madeline with Joan of Arc. It's possible that the myth just built up from there. It is more logical to assume that Madeline put on the cask for better head protection. With a musket in her hand and a soldier's helmet on her head, Madeline told her brothers that it was up to them and their duty was to save the fort. Something in her words even made the cowardly soldier snap too, at least for a while. Madeline's two brothers and the two soldiers took to the bastions and kept steady fire on the enemy. Madeline ran to the cannon and fired it into the air. She had two reasons for doing this. One, it was a scare tactic to the Iroquois to show that Fort Verchere was a force to be reckoned with. Two, it was made to alert the fort's other soldiers who were away hunting to stay away and take refuge in some other fort. Laundry Day It was one o'clock in the afternoon. The Iroquois were around the fort sacking and burning the houses of the settlers while killing their cattle. Everyone knew this was going on. For some reason, it entered Madeline's mind that she had left three sacks of linen and some quilts outside the fort. It further entered her mind that she really needed that fabric. This might sound like an entirely stupid risk, but here is the reality of the situation. Material for clothing, at that time, was an expensive necessity and very hard to get. Madeline had been placed in charge of it. She had left the linen to bleach by the bank of the river. If it was at all possible to retrieve this material, she had to try it and bring it back. Madeline asked the two soldiers to go out with her to retrieve the clothes. Showing their cowardly colors once again, they refused. Madeline was more than a little put out with their job performance so far. Exasperated, she had her two brothers accompany her. She did, however, tell the soldiers to keep their fire at the enemy. At least they did that much. Madeline and her brothers brought back the linen and quilts without incident. It's amazing and incredibly brave, but Madeline had a certain swagger about her that even the Indians had to acknowledge. Inside voices, please. With all the gunfire and commotion, the sounds of constant crying and shrieking could still be heard by the women and children. It was understandable. They lost loved ones already and were scared. Nevertheless, Madeline had to explain to the women that they had to keep quiet. If she and the other defenders of the fort could hear all that sad, terrible noise, so could the enemy. The Indians would think that everyone inside was helpless and easy to conquer. It was hard, but the women and children managed to control themselves. 
stepping out again. It wasn't long after Madeline's talk with the women that she spotted a canoe on the river. It was family friend Pierre Fontaine and his family coming to visit. They didn't know what was going on. They had to be saved. Madeline ordered the two soldiers to go to the Fontaines and help them. Being devout cowards, they once again refused to leave the fort. Madeline then told her servant, Laviolette, to stand sentry at the gate and leave it open while she went to the Fontaines. She told the people that if she got killed that they were to shut the gate and keep fighting to the end. Madeline had the idea that maybe by leaving the gate open it would psych out the Iroquois and make them think it was a ruse, like they would be running into a trap. With musket in hand and a helmet on her head, she went to the bank and met the family. A bit more trickery was to follow. Madeline had the Fontaines march before her, calmly, to give the Iroquois the illusion that there was more danger in them attacking. Madeline and the Fontaines were flexing, but it totally worked. They got safely inside and shut the gate. When the light goes down. Day was slowly but surely turning into night. Madeline knew the Iroquois were still out there. The weather was turning bad. A heavy wind blew from the northeast, bringing with it snow and hail. Plus, it looked like the storm was going to settle in for the evening. Amazingly, the bad weather wasn't scaring away the Indians. Madeline believed they were planning to invade the fort under cover of darkness. In all, Madeline now had six troops in her command. Two were her brothers. Two were the soldiers. One was La Violette. The other was Pierre Fontaine. She ordered Fontaine and the two soldiers to go into the red out with the women and children. It was the strongest, safest place in the fort, and they could defend themselves from inside. The four bastions would be occupied by Madeline, her brothers, and the 80-year-old La Violette. Like before, they made a lot of noise and pretended that they were a big army. They regularly called out to each other, All's well! from their respective bastions. The Iroquois were completely deceived. This would later be confirmed by the Iroquois themselves. The Indians had really wanted to make a full attack on the fort during the night, but wanted to play it safe. Besides, they had already lost a lot of men that day thanks to Madeline and her brothers. And the cow says, Muh? It was about one o'clock in the morning. The weather was still bad. In the moonlight's reflection on the snow, the small band of heroes noticed some of their cattle outside the gate. They managed to get away from the Indians. Laviolette wanted to let the cattle in. Madeline halted him. She knew the Iroquois were smart and not to be underestimated. There was an old Iroquois trick where they would disguise themselves with cattle hides and march inside the fort behind the real cattle. Madeline did not want that to happen. However, she also didn't want to lose any more cattle. She decided to have her two brothers stand by the gate with their muskets ready to fire. The gate was opened and the cattle were let in. Fortunately, there were no Indians trying to sneak inside. Were they gone? It was hard to know. There has to be a morning after. <laughs> morning came, and everyone inside could breathe a little easier. But that didn't mean the Iroquois weren't out there. They fired the cannon every hour in hopes to not only keep the Indians at bay, but maybe get help from someone in Montreal. After all, Montreal was not that far away. About 20 miles. What they didn't know is that they would be waiting a long time. The Fontaines were all cool with staying at the fort, with the exception of Pierre's wife, Marguerite. She was a bit snobbish to begin with, and denounced the fort that gave them safety, basically calling it a dump. Marguerite wanted Pierre to take the family to Fort Contrasseur, three hours away where she would feel safer. She wasn't letting up on her demand. Pierre finally told her, 
that she could take the children in a canoe if she wanted to, but that he would never leave the fort as long as Madeline was in charge. Madeline was never going to abandon the fort. Ever. The following days were difficult. She didn't eat much, and she didn't get much sleep. At the same time, she did her best to stay positive to keep everyone else from freaking out. The Iroquois were probably long gone by this point, but how could they be sure? Eight days later, assistance to the fort was not speedy. Why would this be? There are no great answers. Did the winter weather hold them back? Were they busy somewhere else? Or did they just not know that Fort Verscher was in crisis? Whatever the case, and according to Madeline, it took eight days for the army to arrive. Madeline was having a rare moment of sleep. Her head rested on a table with her musket across her arms. All of a sudden, one of Madeline's sentries, probably Laviolette, heard voices on the water. It was night. He told Madeline, and she quickly went up to the bastion to see if it was friend or foe. Thankfully, it was the French. From the bastion, she talked to the leader of this outfit, a Lieutenant Le Monnerie, and agreed to meet him down at the riverbank. Le Monnerie had with him about 40 soldiers. The weary but clearly competent teenage girl saluted the lieutenant and famously said, I surrender my arms to you. Le Monnery famously replied, Mademoiselle, they are in good hands. The lieutenant inspected the fort and was blown away by the fact that not only was it still standing, but it appeared to be in satisfactory condition, with a sentry at each bastion. Madeline made the request that Le Monnery relieve them of their duty as they had been there for eight days, which he gladly obliged. What happened next? Le Monnery and his men captured the Iroquois who so terribly plagued Fort Verscher and returned the kidnapped settlers. By this time, Madeline's parents had returned, and news of her heroic actions had spread throughout the land. We know of two deaths for sure, but no one believes the white fatalities were very high. It is also believed by some that the settlers were tortured by burning before they were saved. We don't know how many Iroquois were killed. Madeline was a good shot, and she wasn't the only one shooting, so it's reasonable to guess that they got a lot of them. Life returned to normal in Verchere. Francois and Marie Jarret would have two more children, bringing the total number to 12. Madeline became known far and wide as Madeline de Verchere, named after the fort she so gallantly saved. Sadly, Madeline's father died in 1700. His military pension was then transferred directly to Madeline due to her defense of Fort Verscher, but only if she kept providing for her mother. Madeline managed Verscher and worked hard to keep it from falling into great poverty. She also spent a lot of time hunting, and anyone who knew her agreed that no one was a better shot. You would think this tough living would have made Madeline a hard, bitter person. Actually, there are accounts of Madeline being a nice, agreeable person with great charisma, but also modest and ladylike. When she did have a temper, however, she could be quite sinister. If you acted right around her, Madeline would treat you right. If you tried to get in her face, she'd drop you like a ton of bricks. In late 1706, at the age of 28, Madeline married a lieutenant of the Colonial Regular Troops. His name was Pierre Thomas Tyru de la Peyrade, and he came from an old noble family. They lived at St. Anne de la Peyrade, a seigneury in which Pierre owned. Ownership of Verchere was transferred to her husband. I'd like to say that everyone loved and respected Madeline in her lifetime, but that just wasn't the case. She and her husband were the leaders of St. Anne, and not all of the tenants liked them. For the most part, 
Madeline and Pierre really didn't do anything wrong, and the courts upheld it. The legal dramas are too much to get into, and they don't define who she was. Madeline and Pierre Thomas had five children. Only two of them survived to adulthood. A number of heroic stories about Madeline popped up after the 1692 incident. It's hard to say what is fact and what is fiction. One story from 1722 is a standout. Her husband was lying sick in bed when he was attacked by a group of angry Abenaki Indians. Why did they attack? That's one part of the story we don't know. An Indian came at her with a tomahawk. Madeline was able to take the tomahawk away from the wild Indian. The excitable assailant then jumped onto a chest. Madeline struck him in the stomach with his own tomahawk and he fell to her feet, dead. <laughs> All of a sudden, Madeline was surrounded by four angry Abenaki women and they were about to kill her. It was then that her 12-year-old son, Charles, came to her rescue and the family gained the upper hand. The Abenaki surrendered. You would think a woman this tough would never die. But she did, at the age of 69, in 1747. Her husband would die 10 years later at the age of 79. Madeline was buried under the pew of her church in St. Anne. It's all in the details. Historians have debated about what Madeline did and how she did it. She was a real person, and she did save Fort Verchere. That we know for certain. The story as it has been presented comes from two official accounts in Madeline's own words. A lot of research was put into the details of the story that Madeline didn't give in order to present the most faithful account of her adventures. Madeline de Verchere is special and she deserves to be celebrated as faithfully as possible. A Young Lady's Legacy For many, many years after Madeline's death, her exploits fell into obscurity. It's unnecessary to look for an explanation. Time plays into it a bit, as do political and social views. Madeline wasn't rediscovered until the 1860s when her own manuscript letters were found. After that, Madeline was given a lot of love in Canada through the 1920s for sure. She became the subject of poems, art, literature, and other touching tributes. A play was made about her in 1918. One of the first French-Canadian films was made about her in 1922. Her likeness and her story were used for recruitment posters and such things in both world wars, encouraging women in Quebec, as well as all of Canada, to participate in the war effort. Somewhere along the lines, in the middle of the 20th century, all his attention to Madeline dropped off. She has never been completely forgotten, but she hasn't been celebrated enough. Not one, but two statues of Madeline were commissioned. Although both statues are similar, it is the big one that stands in Verchere that has become most recognized. As a matter of fact, it is the best known item associated with Madeline. Erected in 1913, it is a bronze statue that stands over 23 feet tall. The detail is quite impressive, and it faces the St. Lawrence River, just as she did all those years ago. Madeline's story is for everybody, not just for girls who want to do big things. It's about looking the devil in the face and spitting in it. Forget the odds. Sometimes you've just got to do what needs to be done. It's a part of living, and Madeline did her share of that, making her a true action hero of history. <laughs>